But where's Fraser? There. Awesome. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for January 3rd, 2014. How cool is that? 2014. Did you know? <clears throat> oh, go ahead. We're in the future. I know. I know. We're this now. is really in the future now. One more one year and I'll get a hoverboard. Man. Yeah, no, 2015. <laughs> Back to the we are, you know, we already have all, about half of the Star Trek te technology, so I'm not really that. Uh, I'm pretty sure we'll we'll make it by the end. Hold on um, a second. I got a I got a call coming in. <laughs> <laughs> right we need a so phaser joining app. me this week, <clears throat> we've got Brian Coberline. Hey, Brian. Hi. Got David Dickinson. Hey. You're not a time traveler. We'll get into that in a second. I promise. We searched. We looked. <laughs> Emily Lakdawalla. Yay, it's Emily. She's got big news. Uh, and we got uh, Jason Major. Hey, Jason. Who <laughs> evidently doesn't have big news. Doesn't have big news. <laughs> no, no big news. <laughs> So you probably are expecting a preview of all of the things that are going to be happening in the next uh, in the next year, and you'd be right. We're going to have a big update on all the planetary. We talked about all the all the observational stuff last week. This week we're going to talk about all of the planetary stuff that's happening. Uh, we're also going to be talking about uh, the quadranted meteor shower, uh, the first asteroid of the year that hit the Earth, the hmm, what else? The crescent moon. The 10th anniversary of Spirit, the superluminous supernova, the SpaceX launch, the Chang'e Chang'e Chang 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 rover, and uh, and the search for time travelers. All right, so let's get with the big story, which is the what's up with planetary exploration in 2014. And Emily, what what is the big news? Oh, you know what? Before we do this, sorry, I want to let people know that they can interact with us because I know that's what they want to do. So if you want to pose any questions, comments, ideas, feedback, whatever, uh, you can do that. I've, en I've enabled the QA app in the Hangout on Air, so all you have to do if you're on YouTube, if you're on, uh, if you're on Google+, Plus, wherever you're seeing this, you can just uh, ask a question in the QA app. We'll see the list of questions. You can vote your favorites, and we'll try to sort of answer these questions as we, as we do the show. So that's the place. Anywhere else, I promise you, I won't even notice. So... Um, Okay, Emily, what's the big news? What are we gonna? What can we look forward to this year? Well, this year, uh, the big news is Rosetta. At least we hope it will be. So Rosetta is the European Space Agency's biggest planetary mission. It was launched 10 years ago to chase down a comet, to enter orbit at it, and actually put a little lander on the surface. It'll be the first mission ever to have done so. But the first thing it has to do is wake up. And that's scheduled for January 20. The thing is that the Europeans don't yet have the ability to send nuke-powered spacecraft into space, so they have solar panels. Comets are really far from the sun. In order to chase this one down, they had to go even farther than the comet was from the sun, and their solar panels didn't produce enough energy. So they actually had to shut down their spacecraft a couple of years ago and wait out this low-power period while they were on this orbit that went went far from the sun. So on January 20th, the spacecraft has like three alarm clocks, hope it doesn't hit the snooze button too many times, and is supposed to contact Earth for the first time in two and a half years. That is going to be an absolutely terrifying day for me and I think many other people who hope that this mission will be as great as its promise is and that all of this ten years of, of cruise will amount to something incredible. Now it's going to land on a comet. This is brand new. This is absolutely brand new. It won't be the first landing on a very small body. Um, both uh, the near Shoemaker spacecraft landed on Eros at the end of its mission and Hayabusa touched down on an asteroid. But it will be the first landing on a comet. And not only that, but this it, the mission is not just a lander. It's actually mostly a big orbiter with a, with a small lander. And they're going to be doing things like radar sounding through the body of the, ast uh, the comet by sounding from the spacecraft to the lander, if they can manage to land successfully, which is a big if, because like I said, this has never been attempted before. And you have to realize, this spacecraft has been cruising for 10 years. It was designed even longer before that. Um, Hayabusa had not gotten anywhere close to Itokawa before they designed this mission. We hadn't had most of our comet flybys, so they designed this lander without really knowing what comets looked like up close too well. So um, I think that the the landing should not be taken for granted as something that's going to succeed. They, I have high hopes that they'll get into orbit, and I'll have high hopes that they'll manage to 
um, lithobrake the lander into the comet, but but let's see. I, I'm reserving judgment on whether they're going to be successful on that part of it, but I wish them all the best, and I can't wait to see the images from their amazing cameras um, that they'll be sending back from this comet. And so what is the landing date? When should we be look, looking forward to this? Um, that's toward the end of next year. So they're going to start approaching the comet this year. We'll get slow a uh, slow approach of it. They'll do surveys. They'll enter orbit in, in the summer, and the landing is scheduled for, I think, November of this year. But that's not the only thing that's happening in 2014. So um, we also have two spacecraft that should be arriving at Mars, including India's first mission to Mars. Um, the American mission will be arriving at the same time in September, but it doesn't carry a camera, so our, our hopes for cool images will come from the Indian spacecraft, which is going to have this high elliptical orbit that should get really nice full globe pictures of Mars. It'll be a really unique um, set of images. That should be pretty awesome. What is, Maven doesn't have a camera? What is it got? Just a nose? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> it's um it's designed to look at the upper atmosphere of Mars. And you know, we've got a lot of great Mars cameras. I heard that they were offered a spare camera from another mission and they were like, you know what? It it would be super, but it just doesn't match our mission goals and would make it too complicated and expensive. So no. Um, so they actually turned down a camera. Um, but that's okay. There are lots of great cameras still operating there, but most of them are really old, including one whose mission is celebrating its 10th anniversary today, which I suppose we'll talk about later, which is Opportunity. Um, but other things going on in space, uh, there's, like I said, five active missions at Mars. Um, Curiosity just celebrated Sol 500 yesterday. There is a mission get, sniffing up dust at the moon. There's another one orbiting the moon, taking pictures of landers. Messenger is still at Mercury. Venus Express is still at Venus. Um, Cassini is still at Saturn, and we'll be spending this entire year looking down upon the rings and the poles of Saturn and Titan, and it will be early next year, in 2015, that it will be getting side views um, of Saturn, which will allow it to see moons again. And throughout this year, Dawn and New Horizons will be traveling toward their respective dwarfed planets, that Ceres for Dawn and Pluto for New Horizons, <clears throat> and their missions will begin to get really exciting in January of 2015. Yeah, next year is almost more exciting, I think, with, <laughs> with New Horizons. I have to agree. It'll be the year of the dwarf planet because um, uh, Dawn will actually get to and see Ceres before New Horizons gets good pictures of Pluto. So that'll be two, actually really three, if you count Sharon, as another round body that we've never seen before. So we'll have three new round, uh, interesting geolo geologically interesting worlds to explore in the beginning of 2015. We last week, or I guess we were talking in the uh, with the Deep Astronomy. They did a live broadcast about the year in review, and it was their opinion that this is really the golden age of astronomy. Do you think we're in the golden age of planetary exploration? Absolutely. In fact, I travel the country giving a talk of that title, talking about. Do you really? How, yeah, I do about the gold. We are currently in the golden age of planetary exploration. This year is going to be good. It's going to be a peak in terms of the number of, of uh, planetary missions that are out there, probably, or at least a plateau. Um, 2015 is going to be spectacular. Uh, 2017 will also be spectacular with uh, Juno at Jupiter. Um, and uh, and and so on, but it's it's really the peak for NASA. At least other planetary, at least other space exploration agencies are beginning to ramp up their planetary missions. So we have a lot to look forward to, from Japan, and the European Space Agency, and so on. But for NASA, this is really the peak this this next couple of years. Super cool. Um, now, did she miss any that you caught, David? Um, not really. I was, I was thinking of uh, A1 Siding Spring. The comet A1 Siding Spring is going to be passing Mars right as those uh, those probes arrive. Uh, yeah. Just kind of uh, ironic thing. In and that's going to be both cool and terrifying because you're talking <laughs> about spacecraft passing through the coma of a comet that were not designed to pass through the coma of a comet. <clears throat> and they're talking about you know trying to adjust the orbits of a couple of the orbiters so that they hide behind Mars during the closest approach to avoid getting. Um, you know, pelleted with stuff from the comet, but we'll have to see. For the rovers down on the surface, it, it should be a really great sky show. Um, they should they should be able to get some nice pictures of of meteors. I hope. I don't know what their imaging plans are, and who knows what their power will be. It'll be nighttime stuff. So I, I I saw a tweet, Emily, from New Horizons too, saying that this November they turn on permanently for their Pluto flyby for the Pluto that's, encounter. That's right. Um, they begin yeah. to get better images than. Um, then Hubble can get of Pluto somewhere around February of next year. So that yeah. means that they're going to start a few months uh, before that. They're going to start um, doing regular approach imaging because you 
you know, believe it or not, we actually don't know Pluto's position precisely enough to get um, exact targeting for some of the close approach imaging. So for their images that they'll be taking with Pluto at close approach, well, they actually have to sequence a sort of a row of images to make sure that they'll cover Pluto thoroughly because our uh, our the accuracy of our orbit is not all that great. So some of the orbit determination stuff that they'll be doing toward as they do their approach may, may begin to help a little bit. Um, but it's still, it, it's kind of amazing to consider that we've looked at this object for 75 years plus and, and we still don't know exactly where it is. <laughs> yeah, it's so I, cool. It'll be cool if it finds more moons. I bet it might. It may. So, so Emily, how long have you been reporting on this stuff for now? Oh gosh, well I, I, I joined the Planetary Society in 2011 actually to work on a public outreach project that was associated with the Mars Exploration Rover missions. Um, so then I wasn't a space writer. It, it was kind of interesting to look back to its 10 year anniversary. At that time I was an educator, I was a project person, but I didn't do anything in the public. And it was only after this project ended, after the 90 saw mission end, ended, that they were like, hey, you want to do some writing for the website? And so I started writing about Cassini and now I am where I am now. So I guess I've been writing for about 10 years as well. The blog yeah. is, is seven plus years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be uh, Universe Today's 50th, 15th anniversary in in uh, in March. Wow. So, yeah, it's crazy. Um, cool. Okay. Well, let's move on. So uh, and so, David. Any any anyone else? Any other space stories that that you think are going to be uh, interesting? Th there are as far as uh, manned missions. I don't know if you want to get into those. Uh, yeah. As far totally. As, uh, well, they're, it's not crewed this year, but the Orion is going to do its first test launch. They're going to do their first launch of the of the multi-purpose vehicle later this year, and there are going to be a lot of uh, SpaceX launches starting this Monday, as a matter of fact. They're going to be doing more resupply missions up to the ISS. Uh, Antares Orbital Sciences is doing a launch next week. There's a lot of private missions. Virgin Galactic is going to be starting uh, space tourism flights, hopefully, this year. That's going to be interesting to see. The Falcon 9 Heavy may launch this year. That'll be cool. SpaceX actually puts that up. Uh, SpaceX, SpaceX really has a full dance card this year. It's going to be amazing if they get as many launches as they want to get off nearly one a month. Some months there's there's two or three launches even. So looking ahead, there it's like wow, they they're really ambitious this year. It's now weird. SpaceX is looking at uh, is looking at getting their um, their Dragon capsule. Uh, they're working towards the human. Human that's right. On that. That's right. So you know, I mean, that's going to be one. I know that they're uh, they're planning some um, some test flights uh, for the what do they call that when they have the the emergency system, the emergency rocket system there. Yeah. So they're working on that later on uh, towards the end of the year. So that'll be a big deal too. It's kind of going to yeah. be kind of cool to see Orion get its flight off, but it's kind of depressing when you look ahead. Well, when are they going to do their first crewed launch? And it's like 2020. I'm like, wow. <laughs> it's like, what are we, so what are they doing in six years between this year and 2020? Well, it's weird when That's you think about it. Like, like we're now experiencing, as you say, this golden age of planetary exploration. But this is based on 10 years of good launch, good decisions, good missions, yeah. etc. But now we're looking at this, at this shutdown and defunding and lack of new missions, but at the same time strangely matched with inexpensive launch vehicles and a, and a revolution in the way stuff gets out into space. So I really wish like this would be the time to pair up these low-cost, really clever missions with these inexpensive, very affordable launch options. I mean there could be so much more science getting done over the next couple of years, if you could bring these things together, it's it's strange that that you're getting this this revolution in lowering launch costs at the same time, this decline in in expenditures on planetary exploration. All, it's really all, frustrating. All these all these missions, like Mars One and uh, Dennis Tito's proposed 2018 flyby, whenever you see the Artemis concept, they're all counting on SpaceX hardware because that's what they they depict all the time in in their uh, in their plans. Every time you see somebody come up with a new "Let's go to Mars" plan. That that's uh, yeah. So they're all counting on SpaceX. It looks like to me. So I can I can just imagine Emily giving the opposite talk in about <laughs> five years. Well, it's kind of funny because it, it's a similar environment that caused the Planetary Society to exist in the first place. It was the 
the very end of the 1970s, you had Voyager and Viking doing absolutely amazing things at the same time that funding was being cut for planetary exploration. And as a result, you know, we existed and we started, the Planetary Society started advocating for space exploration in a time when people were at a peak of excitement about space exploration. And yet the 1980s, you look at them and they were just lousy with virtually no new launches in space missions. Of course, it wasn't helped by the Challenger disaster. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that, that this is just a lull, it's another downswing that's going to be followed by another upswing. I'm very hopeful that private funding and lower prices and cheaper and smaller spacecraft will enable more exploration of the Moon and Mars and maybe near-Earth asteroids in the near future. But we still really rely on government funding for deep space exploration, especially to the outer solar system. And I'm very worried about that because when Cassini and Juno end in 2017, we currently have no uh, mission. NASA has no outer planets mission being developed. ESA at least has JUICE, which is going to be a, a Jupiter orbiter that's going to be launched in 20, 2022, I think. But that's, yeah, that's tw and like in arrive at like 2030. Like, yeah, and arrive in 2030. So is, there is an enormous gap. Now, there is actually quite a lot of data that could keep scientists alive for a long time if we were funding them to study it. But we're not even funding scientists to study the data that we have right now. It's it's lunacy. So that's where uh, go to planetary.org slash SOS to express your opinion about this, to write Congress and the administration, talk about how important space exploration is for yeah, em Emily, I, I don't believe there's any interplanetary missions leaving this year, are there? Uh, leaving this year, there is one. Um, so Hayabusa 2 from ah, Japan is launching okay. in December. Um, this was a mission, this is actually will be an interesting story because they had not planned a Hayabusa 2 until Hayabusa 1 returned and, and and it just captivated the um, the imagination of the Japanese people. The mission was so such a challenge. It was so star-crossed. It kept on running into problems, and yet the ingenious engineer saved it. And then when it came back, when it sent its sample return capsule, initially it was supposed to just fly by Earth and drop the capsule, but um, the spacecraft was basically dead, and so it followed the capsule down and burned up in the shower of brilliant sparks. They made three feature films that showed in movie theaters in Japan about Hayabusa, and so the public clamored for a follow-on to this mission and they're doing another one. Very cool. That's the way it should be. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, basically the, that's basically the picture that always gets thrown around the internet anytime <laughs> something enters the atmosphere and they don't I have was a thinking that. Yeah, it's right. like, oh, here's Hayabusa, yeah. look at Me that. That's yeah. Meteor cool. scene over the <laughs> Netherlands and then they use the Hayabusa that, re-entry. Yeah. The re-entry of Mir in bad scenes from Armageddon. Those always end up getting <laughs> yeah. thrown around. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got a question for you from Guido Bibra. Uh, question for Emily: Will the Planetary Society hangout come back someday? Or are you guys too busy? <laughs> we're we're kind of busy. I know um, some people definitely like that. We had a few regular viewers who really loved it, but it was really hard to support every week. So uh, we'll try to do hangouts from time to time, but probably not a weekly one. Well, well, anytime you need a lovely assistant, I'm glad to help. <laughs> Thank you. Um. All right, and I think uh, Hannah Tankery says, and I think this is exactly right, which is I remember being in kindergarten and looking at pictures of the planets. This was 1996, so we had really nice images of all the planets except Pluto, which was very frustrating to me at age five. So New Horizons fulfilling a lifelong desire of mine. And, and it, us writers, us writers need more images too because we've only got six to pick. We, we have to use the same yeah. picture every time. <laughs> no, I actually, I want to challenge. You know, since I've got a bunch of you writers on here, I want to challenge you writers to, about. There's, we actually have a perception problem. We have a problem, a communication problem in planetary exploration right now, because we're we've done the the initial reconnaissance of the planets, right? People still think of Pluto as the last planet, and when we we check off Pluto, we're done. We've, we've explored all the planets. Now the missions that we're talking about are being really exciting are places like Ceres and Europa, and people are like, Europa? I've never heard of that. Why should I care? So we need to talk more about these things that are not planets and why they are especially cool to explore. Um, not just Pluto, and, and I think that Pluto actually presents an opportunity because it isn't a planet anymore, it is merely the first of this amazing new class of bodies that is incredibly important for us to explore. Things like Pluto's friends out there in the Kuiper Belt, like Eris and Haumea and Makimaki Maki and Varuna and Quawar and Orcus and Ixion and all these other great names. And then you've got Ceres alone in the asteroid belt, the only dwarf planet there. Um, and then you've got all of these moons of the giant planets, great places like Europa and Io and, and Ganymede and Enceladus and Titan, all of these places we need to explore them and we need to tell people why we need to explore them. So that's my soapbox. 
<laughs> Nicely done. So we can all agree 2014, it's going to rock. 2015 is going to be even better, and then after that, it's going to start to get a little dicey. So um, <laughs> moving on. Uh, Dave, it's the 2014 Quadrantids. Yes, uh, this weekend, as a matter of fact, this is possibly one of the better meteor showers looking ahead for 2014, and one of the reasons is the moon just went past new a couple days ago. This meteor shower, however, comes in January, which is wintertime in the northern hemisphere, so places like where Jason is right now, he's in negative temperatures. It's a little cold to be out watching meteor sure. showers. Uh, I was going to get up and watch this morning. The quadrants should be peaking right now, as a matter of fact. They were scheduled to peak right around 1930 uh, universal time, which we just passed. Um, I'm going to watch again in the morning, probably. They usually have a zenithal hourly rate, an ideal rate of around, the last few years have been about 100 to 120, which is right about the highest, marks one of the highest annual predicted showers, along with the Geminids and the Parasids. These ones usually, Persia, usually perform. However, the Quadratids also have a very narrow peak of about only 6 to 10 hours. So uh, on either side of those peaks, you'll get a zenithal hourly rate of about maybe 10 to 20. Then you'll get a sharp maximum. 2010, I believe it was, I had a pretty good maximum here that we saw from Florida. Uh, it's probably one of the only times I'd ever even seen a quadrant because if you look a morning or two on either side of the peak of the shower, you'll be like, there's no meteors at all. Uh, and the radiant only rises a few hours after uh, local sunrise. So it's, it's, uh, you'll, you'll be seeing them coming off from the uh, north-northeast. This shower, incidentally, we always get to talk about the obsolete constellation that it's named after, uh, the mural quadrant, Quadrans Mural. Morales. Uh, people always ask me, it's like, why does this meteor shower have such an odd name? It's because it's named after a constellation that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there's been a lot of constellations over the years in history that have just fallen off to the wayside and were never adopted when they officially uh, cemented what the, uh, the modern day constellations we use. And this one just kind of made it into the modern lexicon as a meteor shower. What does your horoscope say if you're a quadrant? <laughs> <laughs> if you're a, you're a quadrant, I would hate I'd hate to know, really. I, I, I don't know. I have some astrologers that follow me on Twitter that could probably tell you something about that. But. That would be great. <laughs> it says it's cold outside. That's what it says. <laughs> so have you I've heard... heard weather. Okay, so, so I think I'm going to do something that I've never done, which is I'm going to get involved in a little bit of uh, sort of outrage. So two things. One, uh, the beginning of the new Beyonce song has recording from the Challenger accident. <laughs> Have you heard about this controversy? A little bit. So, no. Yeah. So the opening of the of the new Beyonce song is the sort of after the explosion. I guess they're referring to her boyfriend troubles on relation to the uh, to the tragedy of the Challenger accident. So anyway, the, the internet went berserk. Uh, and There's the second, a lot of raging on Twitter about it. Yeah, there was a lot of rage. So, you know, what do you think? Should should uh, catastrophes be used for music videos? Um, and the second thing is uh, the Science Center, the Space Center in Vancouver, is doing a special in the planetarium with an astrologer. What? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. So that's my yeah, that's my local planetarium. It's a great planetarium, great people run it, and yeah, they're gonna have a special with an astrologer come in and they're gonna do some night of cosmic wonderment. You know, and, I, I know. I, I could speak very briefly about the astrology, but I have a lot of friends that are into astrology and I usually try to get them over and, and like show them the real sky and uh, rather than kind of put off their beliefs and, and try to put them down. You know, try to interest them because you know, because there's there's a little there's a seed of interest there in the universe and space in a lot of these people, and I know there's there's a harm when people spend a lot of money on astrology when they're wasting their money on bunk a lot of times. So yeah. there there is a, a what's the harm angle to it as well. So uh, that would discourage me too, but I don't know if they're presenting any kind of uh, opposing viewpoint in there. Or... I get a lot of funny emails with the with you know with our phases of the moon app. That, that we have where some people are outraged yeah. that we have the we put the zodiac symbol for where the moon is in the sky so you know which is like it's, like it's a purposely per, you know perfectly good astronomical oh. reason why you would want to know which constellation I, the moon is currently in right so you know where it is yeah, I, there's value to that I, right 
but I get. I, I've I get, had a lot of. I've had a lot of argument. There, the houses and, and signs in astrology are different because they don't take into effect the precession of the equinoxes. They go by solar longitude, so they're not even by the standard constellation. I've I've had this whole argument with yeah. lots of people on Twitter before. So yeah. it's uh, so. yeah. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> we were trying to summon Phil to some kind of rage to rage against <laughs> this uh, event, but I don't know if he's taken the bait yet. Um, okay, well let's move on. Uh, Jason, the first yes. asteroid of the year. Yes, we have. Uh, we officially have had the first. Oh, it's a, wore the shirt in honor of it. The first asteroid. <laughs> of the I do have an asteroids T-shirt on, and um, it. The asteroid was discovered on January one by the Catalina Sky Survey, which runs out of Tucson, Arizona, um, and it was. It's. It wasn't a big asteroid. It was a. Uh, it was what's called an Apollo asteroid, which means its orbit crosses Earth's orbit. Um, and it was about you know two to three meters wide, and uh, actually traveling pretty fast at the breakneck speed of, and I jotted this down, uh, 38 kilometers a second, which translates to 85,000 miles an hour. So this uh, relative to Earth. So this was a very quickly moving asteroid. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to learn too much more about it because the very next day it impacted Earth uh, somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, over the central Atlantic. Now, the, um, the an immediate talk on the Internet, and fortunately, uh, you know, the, my, my, astronomy, uh, my astronomy contacts on Twitter were talking about it, and I got to see some charts over where it probably landed and, um, or at least impacted the, uh, the atmosphere. It wasn't, it's not thought that any part of it actually uh, survived to hit the ocean or land or anything like that, but um, was basically anywhere between the western coast of Africa and the Caribbean. Um, so, you know, over, over the next few hours, um, scientists looked at uh, infrasound data that was, that was collected by uh, uh, various satellites and such and, and, um, and buoys and things that can measure sound in the atmosphere. And it, it turns out that it probably landed um, or probably impacted the atmosphere somewhere about 1,900 miles east of Venezuela. So I have a handy globe here. And uh, that would put it right about <laughs> oh there. So it's not known if if anything did hit the water. It, even if anything did, there's really nothing. You know, there's really no there's no islands there. There's really not much going on there except perhaps some shipping lanes. Yeah, um, yeah there's so shipping it's not, lanes it, that run that way. So yeah, it's it's not really a spot where people are typically looking at the sky or have cameras set up or surveillance cameras or anything like that. So you know, unfortunately, the very first asteroid discovered in 2014. Um, you know, it's kind of like here today, gone later on that day. Uh, right. So, so RIP 2014 AA, and um, you know, we hardly knew ye. <laughs> um, you know, eventually you know, we'll, we'll find another one. But but what's what's the takeaway from this is here's a you know here's a good size. I mean, it's a good size smaller asteroid. It's estimated that the uh, if it did detonate in the atmosphere, probably released uh, the equivalent of uh, half to half to one kiloton explosion. So if this were to have happened over a populated area or a city, you would definitely know about it. Um, it, it wouldn't be like a Chelyabinsk type event where windows are shattering and doors are getting blown in and people sent to the hospital or anything. But it would be a, uh, an event that people would notice. It would be you know all over the internet. And, you know, so it would be a, it would be an event. Um, and again, it it just shows us shows us that there are things out there that uh, you know, kind of heading our way. We don't really know where they'll land. Most of Earth's surface isn't a populate over a populated area, so fortunately, these things you know are going to land in the ocean or you know some remote location. But you know, eventually, something is going to something of a decent size is going to come near a populated area or an urban center or something. So it's good to know it's good to know where these objects are. So that's why uh, that's why missions like the Sentinel mission uh, are important from the B612 Foundation. That's why you know it's important to have uh, NASA's wise uh, infrared uh, explorer looking out there and, and seeing what's you know what's heading our way, what's crossing Earth's orbit. Um, you know fund fund these missions, support these missions because they're important to us. 
It was a womp rat. They're about two meters. Yeah, you know. Well, you know, it's <laughs> funny. I, I, I've heard the um, I've heard the term uh, referred to these as a flying sofa, and that was um, <laughs> that was off of uh, Phil Plate's Bad Astronomy blog uh, on the, on Discover. So actually, no, not on Discover. On Slate. Um, he's on Slate now. I like that term, flying sofas, because they're you know if you yeah three two to three meters, that's about the size of a sofa. So you know, then take the other dimensions and you figure out how big this thing actually is. <laughs> um, Mark Tatter asks, is it possible for a meteor to intercept Earth slowly and sort of drop down like that edge of space parachute guy? Well, the, the meteors you see during meteor, sh well, meteor showers, of course, those are little dust particles, but when they're coming up behind the Earth, you notice the difference from a, a meteor you see coming up in, in the evening before we're turned forward into the Earth's orbit because those are the ones that leave the long, slow arcs through the sky. The morning meteors are the ones that come really quick because you're getting the head-on velocity between the meteor and the Earth. So, if you look at the relative speeds of um, of near-Earth objects uh, as listed on you know the Minor Planet Center or JPL's uh, database, you'll see that the speeds range, and they're all relative speeds to to the Earth. Um, the speeds range from anywhere you know seven to eight kilometers uh, a second, all the way up to you know this was actually a really fast, uh, really fast velocity on 2014 AA. I mean, you know, going 38 kilometers a second, that's, that's, that's speed. That's a fast object. And if you check out the article uh, I put up yesterday on Universe Today, you'll see an animation there that's kind of, uh, it's, it's 2014 AA's point of view as it's heading towards Earth, and it's really kind of just it's really kind of just barreling straight into it. So there, that's where you're getting your, your relative velocity. It's, it's yeah. how it's moving as opposed to how Earth is moving. So if it's coming, you know, we're moving this way and it's coming this way, its relative velocity is a lot faster than if it's just kind of like sliding in. But you it would have to be an object that's essentially in our exact same orbit at the same speed as the Earth and just a little bit different and then we would just slowly run into it. I, I just wonder if an object could remain in that orbit for very long. Like it that's the thing. It's like, it's like, is that yeah. a stable orbit for, for an object actually? No. Being? Probably you not. Know, you know, Jason, that speed probably rules out something we were discussing, uh, me and some other people were discussing this morning about it possibly being space junk from an earlier, uh, like a heliocentric launch. Oh, yeah. It, it wouldn't have that high a velocity, most likely. Usually those are slower velocity moving objects. So Brian, Brian Wang jo joined us. He was having some connection problems. Brian, I muted you because there's some background, there's some echo going on. I don't know, do you have headphones on? Um... Let's see. Can you hear? I don't have headphones on right now. Okay. Okay. Well, it looks like you're okay. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go with uh, <clears throat> Brian coberlin has got one story for us uh, about the super luminous supernova. What's the super story, Brian? Okay. Well, there's there's actually multiple supernova supernova. Um, these are out of the uh, supernova legacy survey, and they're looking at supernova that are particularly bright. We're, we're used to things like, you know, the type 1A supernova where we use them for standard candles. These are 10 to 50 times brighter than that. So they're extraordinarily bright. And there's been a lot of theories about what these types of supernova are. Um, one of them is what's known as pair instability supernova. And the basic idea of that is if you have this really huge star that goes supernova, um, when the core collapses, the, it produces a lot of gamma rays, and if these gamma rays, which are you know, high-energy photons, have enough energy, they can produce pairs of particles. They can produce electron, positron, uh, positron pairs, um, and that causes the luminosity to go way up more than it would be if it was just gamma rays. And so there's been a lot of search for a kind of pair instability supernova. Well, when they looked at a couple of these last year, I think the beginning of last year, they found some that looked like they could be pair instability supernova, but there was a competing model that was um, a magnetar-driven supernova. So the idea with that one is that if you have a highly rotating star, that it creates a strong magnetic field when, when the neutron star is formed, and so you have this what's called a magnetar, which is a neutron star with a really strong magnetic field. And basically the currents of that magnetic field heats up. It's like inductive heating in a stove. It heats up the material around it and causes it to, to flare up much brighter than it would for a, a star of that size. And 
the question was, which is it? Is it, is it pair instability or is it um, uh, magnetar driven? And new observations, I think in November is when they were reported, um, are leaning towards the magnetar model. Uh, the way they curve up to their brightness and have kind of a long trail of, of dimming down is more indicative of magnetar heating than it is of pair instability. So, so that's kind of like the big news in terms of supernova. So, but what would that like? Like, what would that be? Magnetar heating, pair instability. Like, what is the astronomical objects that are? They, they look like very bright supernovas. In this case, they're very bright supernovas that don't have any hydrogen uh, line spectra. So they lack hydrogen. Um, the, the reason this was a question is because if, if they're pair instability supernovas, and these are, these are distant supernovas, so if they're pair instability supernovas, those have to be driven by very, very, very large stars. So probably first-generation stars that are huge, you know, 100 solar masses, 200 solar masses, um, that live very short lives and then explode in these massive explosions. Um, but we're seeing a lot of super luminous supernova, and that would, if they're all these pair instability supernova, then we'd have all these huge super, all these huge stars, and we're not sure why they would form that way. If they're magnetar driven, they don't have to be as large. They can be, you know, 30, 40, 50 solar masses. Um, as long as they have a high rotation. So if they have a high rotation and the neutron star forms with a high rotation, it creates a strong magnetic field, you get a superluminous supernova, but not from a hypernova star. It's not this huge, you know, 100 solar mass or bigger star. Well, I know if you've got a, you know, if you've got a, a massive star, like something in the, like, 15 times the mass of the sun range, then you get a black hole, right? So right. you've got something that's sort of under that in this eight to... But that it's that the star is dying, it's forming a neutron star, it's forming a magnetar, and right. it's releasing all of its energy because of its really rapid rotation. Right, and that's part of it too, is that as the... Before the star goes supernova, it's, it's of course venting off some of its outer layers, which is why these wouldn't have hydrogen in their line spectra because the hydrogen layers are kind of pushed off first, and then you mainly just have helium. Um, right. And so it's, it's the mechanism of how they form. Um, it, it's important because it, it tells us if, if, if we have more magnetar than we have these huge um, pair instability supernovas, then the evolution of the universe is different. The way the um, cosmos is seeded with its first elements is, is different because the mechanisms are different. So it's really kind of a, it's a side effect of the supernova su survey, which was meant to kind of narrow down the parameters or refine the parameters of things like the Hubble constant. And so they're looking at it in terms of this data and looking at the superluminous supernovas, and we're finding that that they're probably not uh, pair instability. Um, and so it was ambiguous, and now we're leaning much more towards the uh, magnetar driven. That's very cool. You're talking parent pair instability, Brian. You're talking like mergers, or no? Parent instability is the gamma rays are so energetic that they produce electron positron ah, okay. pairs. So, okay. so basically, okay. you've got you know the, instead of just having gamma rays come out, then that pushes out the outer layers to form the supernova. You have gamma rays that wow, produce electron, you know, matter and antimatter, and that reacts with okay. the outer layers and creates a super explosion. Um, and that would have been interesting, but it doesn't look like that's the mechanism that we're producing these. Too bad, because that would have been interesting. Yeah. That would <laughs> be interesting. They're cool. still looking for them, and they, they may still be a part of it, but it looks like they're not the only mechanism by which that can happen. Uh, okay, well, let's move on. Uh, so now, Brian, Brian Wang, I'm going to swap over to you, and we've got one time for one story from you, and so, and which I think is right... Uh, is sort of in the space hangout direction, which is the uh, the f fixing the fallout issues with Project Orion, which I think is hilarious. So, uh, so what's Project Orion, and and what is the solution to the problem of dropping fallout on your planet as you launch your spaceship? So, during the fifties and sixties, um, Freeman Dyson and some other of the um, early nuclear pioneers um, were working on a project. Um, to use nuclear bombs for space propulsion. So their work back then was to make smaller nuclear devices 
that uh, they would drop through a hole in a pusher plate that would then it would explode at about, say, 100 or 2,000 tons of equipment TNT, and then would have packed around it various um, boron or other things that would then be turned into plasma that would then push the spacecraft up. So a few hundred nuclear bombs, and then you can go into orbit, a few thousand, you can go anywhere in the solar system. But the issue is that um, <coughs> nuclear bombs, the fission bombs and fusion bombs, so the <coughs> fission bombs with uranium and plutonium have um, metal fallout, which has some long-lasting uh, radiation effects. Um, and fusion bombs are, are not pure fusion bombs. We have the uh, teller ulam fission fusion thing where you have a fission bomb go off, and that sets off the fusion reaction to give you the, the fusion bomb. One of the early pioneers in working on nuclear fusion is a guy called um, Friedward Winterberg, and he um, has won a lot of rewards. Uh, the um, Daedalus project was based off his work, uh, which was uh, a large um, project to go to, I think, Bernard Starr or something like that, that was done by a British society, British Space Society. And he also did early work that became the base, the technical basis for the global positioning system. Um, Edward Teller, um, who was instrumental in creating the various bombs, has said that, had said before he died that um, Peter Winterberg was, is one of the people who doesn't get enough credit for his contribution to the fusion. So his, Winterberg's pedigree in terms of knowing his nuclear stuff, I think is pretty, really rock solid. Um, so he has, over the last few years, uh, published various um, um, new things in regards to um, new ways to do nuclear fusion, and he believes that there is a way to get rid of the fission trigger out of a fusion bomb. So the two advantages, several advantages, one of the advantages is no fission in the, tr in the bomb means no fallout, because you don't have the uranium, you don't have the plutonium, no fallout. Um, the other aspect of it is that you can then have a fusion bomb of various sizes that you no longer have, have to have a critical mass of fission and then that drives how big you have to make your fusion bomb. He can then make his bomb of different sizes. So, so hold so, on a second. Let me just yeah. let me just sort of see if I understand this correctly. So, you, you, with your Ryan project, you've got this gigantic spacecraft. Like literally, these things are the size of skyscrapers. Ma massive, potentially spaceships with a pile of bombs inside. You drop yeah. these bombs out through the bottom of a hole, and then it hits. The bomb explodes. There's a pusher plate. The yeah. spaceship gets pushed the other way up into space, right. up oh, sorry, up into the air a little bit, and then it starts to fall down, and it drops another bomb. That bomb goes off, goes a little higher, keeps right. going, keeps going. Now, of course, with fission bombs, you're leaving this horrible trail of nuclear waste and and fallout behind you as you're using right. the hundred or so bombs to get out of the atmosphere. With right. a, with a fusion bomb, you still need a fission trigger to to start off that fusion bomb. So even if you're going to use relatively clean fusion bombs, you're still dropping out a certain amount of, of fallout even if you can use fusion bombs. So the so the so what's been figured out is how to fire off these fusion bombs without needing that fission trigger. That's right. That's right. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> In oh to launch goodness. one spaceship you let off more nuclear weaponry that's ever been uh, detonated on the surface of the Earth. I can't imagine anything wrong with this. Well, well um, there's several misconceptions about it. One, I was never that concerned about the, the fallout issue because, you know, Freeman did a calculation and said it, you know, might ha have uh, the fallout equivalent of, um, because it's a small bomb, not like the, you know, Ivy might or whatever, bomb. you know, the really big bombs, <laughs> or the, the, the other <laughs> really big bomb. But, so, but it, it, it gets rid of the PR problem, uh, of it, uh, of for, for people, but then there's still the fact that it's nuclear, so that's people's probably still won't be able to handle it. But it still it, goes against the get rid of the get rid of the technical issue of it. Um, the other thing was um, that because the, the the bombs they tend to be uh, smaller. The other thing is that if you can go to anywhere, you know, a significant fraction of um, the speed of light, whether you do it with nuclear or not. Let's say you did with you know some kind of laser array propulsion thing, or 
<clears throat> once I'm doing that, then if I was to launch, if I, you know, once we can get around the solar system very easily, and I can you know, set up on the moon, and then I can go to, let's say, 5% speed of light. You know, with nuclear, I do it some other way. But if I go to 5% speed of light, if I was to run that thing back into the Earth, then I'm doing it with the equivalent of nuclear power, right? Because of the e equals mc squared, I'm doing that. Even if I was to just drop I, um, metal rods from it and just not, no explosive with it, just drop metal rods from orbit down onto the Earth, those would hit with high explosive power. I've heard you about know, this it, this plan. What's this called? Yeah. It's called something Thor's hammer or something like Thor's that. Thor's hammer. Yeah. 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 It's this idea. Game. Yeah, it's this idea where you where you have the satellite and all it is is just have metal rods and you just when yeah, you want true. to take out a target you just drop one and it just re-enters and then just. Right, boom. because the yeah. kinetic energy. You know, if you if can can you know once you get up to really good space capability, kinetic energy is equal to or better than the nuclear power stuff. So then you basically have to handle the, the strong weapons. But currently, because you know nuclear weapons kind of top of the weapon food chain, you know people get you know, all freaked out about it. Um, but if we can get you know good space capability, all these it's because we're fighting in a in a um, phone booth, that that's the problem. We're still on Earth. We're finding a phone booth. That's that's the whole. Point. We're in the Pacific Island, and the Pacific uh, people who, who never leave the island. Any weapons they have there, you know, if you have machine guns, but just on the island, you know, it's all bad. If you get farther apart, then you know it's, it's less of a deal. And basically, we have to learn to handle it. Because, but I I think yeah. you know there's you know, there's no better use for ICBMs than to take them apart, use half of it as a launcher for a spaceship and the nuclear part and use that for an RTG for a for a future mission even though I'm sure they Emily's going to say that's not possible and and roll her eyes. Uh, well that's that's cool. So so when so so th that then the uh, the Orion program is on we're when are we going to launch next year? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately um, it's still the that's problem the that no one wants to do it. And you have to get, you know, through DOE and other people to, to approve it. So I don't think anyone has the um, motivation, will. We're still probably going to have to depend upon um, Elon Musk and SpaceX and whatever to, right. to make it happen. But technically, it could be done. <laughs> technically, it could be done. We need uh, to give SpaceX nuclear capabilities, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I'm sure in the end, that's what Elon Musk is going to use. He'll be like, to get his 10,000 settlers to Mars, he is going to use the Orion. It's going to be the, the SpaceX, I don't know, super duper dragon or something. Um, okay, I got a question here from Philip Huang who asks uh, Huang, uh, "What are your thoughts on current space travel and the solar sail?" Emily Lockdewall of the Planetary Society, uh, do you think that we can accomplish something like a warp drive or spending space time to travel faster within a hundred years? Well, let, let's start with the solar sail, and then we'll move on to the bending space time after that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let somebody else handle bending space time. But solar sailing technology is actually getting closer to practical applications on actual space exploration missions. I've even seen a, a recent cool proposal for a mission to outer planets that would take uh, that would use basically a disposable solar sail to accelerate you out toward the, the um, uh, a distant planet like Uranus or Neptune and then drop the sail so that you can decelerate and, and enter orbit at, at Uranus and, or Neptune. So we're definitely getting closer to to people thinking that those applications are realistic ones to consider for future missions. I'd say we're still a ways away from that. We need to have an actual mission that rendezvous with some point nearer in space. But solar sailing is actually being used currently on current planetary exploration missions to keep their um, their fuel budgets low. Messenger used it while cruising to Mercury because, you know, close to the sun, as Mercury is, the, your solar sailing effects, even on uh, Messenger's fairly small solar panels, are pretty strong. They actually prevented themselves from having to do tech, uh, trajectory correction maneuvers by using solar sailing to in order to, um, to trim their... Uh, to trim their trajectory. And Hayabusa also used it on their way back to Earth because they were down to only a single working engine. They, in order to get three axis stabilization, they used solar sailing to control one of their axes, which was just awesome. So I think we are getting closer to applications of solar sailing for robotic exploration. 
I think that we're going to have to see chemical propulsion get people someplace in our solar system first before we can even begin to think about using solar sailing for that. But you could almost imagine a time when the technology and the, the sort of origami of solar sails has been figured out to the point that, that there is a solar sail component attached to many spacecraft and for certain kinds of maneuvers, for certain kind of orientation, it's going to be their go-to way to do it because it's literally free. And, and absolutely, absolutely, and also if you look at what uh, Japan did with Icaros, I think that um, they have a really compelling model which is to use the solar sail both as a solar sail and as a solar collector. And so you can accomplish both of those tasks with the same material. I think you've really got a way forward in terms of power generation and propulsion. Um, but these are still, in terms of the masses that you need for human exploration, we're really far from that with solar sails. The advantage of solar sails is, is that they can get you to really high speeds, but you, it, it comes at a really high cost in terms of how much sail you need for the amount of mass that you're moving around. So I think that the first practical solar sailing applications are going to be with miniaturized spacecraft and there is no way to miniaturize a spacecraft with a human on it. <laughs> at some point you've got to have the scale of the human in there and that is not a small spacecraft. So we're, we're a long way from that. Brian. Yep. You get yes. the you get the easier question, Brian Koberlein, which is uh, what uh, when will there be warp drives? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, there's a Sunny White like never, who's but... um, working um, at NASA. He has a funded uh, Eagle Works project where he's trying to <clears throat> use um, lasers to generate a small, <clears throat> uh, small tiny perturbation. You know, like a, a little bit of a not a full warp, but a part of it uh, of a of a warp, like let's say one millionth of it, and uh, something that he can detect. So he's trying. To, that's what he's trying to to work on, on creating. Um, I haven't uh, seen the most recent update yet. But, I actually uh, got a chance to meet with with Sonny, right, and uh, and sort of talk to him about his about his plans, and he's he's pretty hopeful for something that will probably never happen, but but still. Um. Right, right. Basically, if he can make that happen, so if he can just make that one millionth of a thing, like make a little bit of a warp happen, then it's, it's his, what he calls his Chicago Pile moment, where it's just like in, in the 30s when they had the Chicago Pile that they made the, the beginnings of their fission uh, reaction, fission bomb, and then they just had to scale it up with their Manhattan Project over the five or whatever years. So he says, once he can prove, okay, one millionth of a little bit of a warp, okay, now we're off to the races. It's possible yep. when we just scale it up, and then warping, and it's uh, the Star Trek world. Uh, I can't, I can't, can't uh, wait. On the Although... comment on, on, um, on what um, was said about solar sails, there is um, work at, with the NASA Advanced um, um, Innovations um, Projects where they're looking to um, assemble... Um, I think uh, not origami like, but with small robots to to put together basically like you're putting together sticks of a tent um, these larger structures. Of course, like uh, with the same weight, you make say ten times the diameter of a telescope or ten times the diameter of solar sail. So then that could get us towards one kilometer size solar sails. So they start getting towards the really big, useful, interesting thing, either for telescopes or for sails. There's a solar sail demonstrator named Sunjammer that's going up early next year, too. That's going yeah. toward the pad. So. Yeah. Uh, so we're just about out of time. I just want to do a couple of really quick stories. Uh, David, Crescent Moon. Yeah, I got the picture here real quick. I'll try to screen save it. Hopefully I don't delete the Internet in the process. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, Emily, an update on the... Uh, the Chinese lunar rover, the Chang'e, Chang'e? Chang'e. Chang'e. <laughs> so Chang'e 3 uh, is the name of the lander, and the rover deployed from it is U-2. And currently, if you look at the picture, we'll get to this picture of the moon in just a second, you can see that it is night on the near side of the moon, so both of those uh, spacecraft are sleeping. But we have heard that um, all of the instruments, all the science instruments on both lander and rover have been operated for the first time, including the alpha particle X-ray spectrometer on the robotic arm of U-2. And the rover has started exploring to the south. Um, it's been really fun to watch this, and there's a lot more information coming out on the internet than I think people realize. It's just all in Chinese, and people are like, oh, they should put stuff out in English. And I'm like, dude, it's China. They shouldn't be putting stuff out in English. And we have 
tools like Google Translate and other translators. Somebody pointed me to think, one on a Chinese website, and it makes it so much easier for me to follow what's well, going on. Think how fast there. Japanese manga gets translated. <laughs> you know, at the very least, you could imagine people translating Chinese uh, moon documents. So All I'm saying is I'm not entitled to China translating their stuff for me. I need to work to make it happen. You need to work so. to make it happen. <laughs> That's right. Well, then you get a scoop. Uh, okay, David, here's your, here's your crescent moon. Yeah, uh, Bob King put out an article in Universe Today uh, earlier this week, right before January 1st, challenging readers in North America to try to cite the extremely thin crescent moon. Now, I got clouded out here in Florida. Uh, this one here, January 1st, was actually the best opportunity this year we were going to get to, to see this. But Mike Wiesner and Rob Sparks out near Oracle, Arizona, actually did manage to catch the moon only 13 hours and 48 minutes past new. And you can see it in there is that very thin, hair-fine sliver in there that's, uh, that's arrowed there on horizon. This is a very, I'm amazed they caught it in a photo because it's very tough to see. Uh, they didn't see it with the unaided eye. They did see it with binoculars, and they did manage to catch an image of it. This isn't quite a record. The record stands right now. There was an Iranian amateur astronomer uh, a few years ago that caught an 11-hour and 40-minute old moon which is very near the Danjon limit of, of what is very possible to catch. I know Thierry Legault actually managed to image the moon at Nu, but of course he's Thierry Legault and he has like uh, superhuman <laughs> he abilities. Really like, stole his soul to the devil to <laughs> be able to yeah. things. That, like, that yeah. he, he, he's not immortal like the rest of us amateur astronomers. Um, <laughs> But uh, this this is kind of cool, and this this definitely I've only I've seen the moon at 17 hours uh, before new in the morning, and it is very difficult with binoculars to see. I mean, you'd almost it's it's very ethereal; it's almost not even there. So th this is kind of a, a cool feat of visual athletics, I think. So it's it's kudos to them. Just look for the arrows. It helps. It helps. <laughs> yeah, the arrows in the yeah. sky. This is the, this is one of the only astrophotos you need averted vision to even look at this photo. So. <laughs> Uh, Emily, 10th anniversary of Spirit? That's right, and we're going to uh, put a whole bunch of new stuff on our website, so go to planetary.org to see that. We've got videos and other, everything celebrating Spirit's 10th anniversary of landing on Mars. It's absolutely incredible. Of course, Spirit died um, a few years ago, but Opportunity is still going, and we'll be celebrating Opportunity's 10th anniversary in a couple of weeks. Um, it's absolutely amazing what these rovers have accomplished, and Opportunity is on the rim of Endeavour Crater, enjoying basically a brand new mission to a brand new landing site after 10 years of being on Mars. It is winter on Mars, right now and so it's going to be a rather low year in terms of activity for opportunity but they've managed to find a north facing slope so as long as they keep hanging around on that slope driving from what they call lily pad to lily pad they'll be able to um, explore the surface um, explore a little bit of this north facing slope over the course of this year in the Martian winter. Fantastic. Uh, and then the last story which sort of piqued my interest was this uh, story about a, uh, about a search for time travelers, David. <laughs> yeah, kind of an interesting study last month. I just came across to my attention this week uh, from the Michigan Technological University that finds no evidence of time travelers by data mining. Mostly they data mined Twitter. They did some Yahoo and Google searches too. They were looking for people that were tweeting about things like Eisen or Pope Francis before like Eisen was discovered in, in 2012, they were looking to see. Uh, now they they had to they had to there was there was some things they had to filter out. So they were looking for people tweeting like pound sign comet Eisen, or pound sign Pope Francis or things like that before. And Pope Francis being the first pope by that name, they figured if anybody was tweeting about that before uh, he was uh, he was coronated as Pope Francis. That maybe it was evidence that somebody. This assumes, of course, that time travelers would come back and care about those things. And uh, they actually uh, invited time travelers to go back and tweet uh, to the pound sign, "I can change the past" or "I can't change the past," and go back and do that to see if it would show up in the history of Twitter. And nobody did, of course. <laughs> it's kind of is similar to what Stephen Hawking did. A few years ago, you might remember Stephen Hawking, I think it was in 2010, he invited uh, time travelers to a party at his house after the party had occurred. And, of course, nobody showed up. But, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's the first serious, uh, semi-serious attempt out there to actually do a search like that. And I thought it was just an interesting use of Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's too bad. I it's really one of those stories that went at it close. I'm like, is, is this an onion story or is this real? And it took me a little bit of digging. I'm like, no, this was actually a serious study that somebody did. Yeah, this was on Astro PH. It's legit, right? 
I think yeah, someone's fishing for it. <laughs> that place is the most legit uh, place to search That could stories. be. Yeah. For their time travelers themselves. Well, we better wrap this up. We're, we're reaching our hour, so uh, so thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. So, Brian Koberlein, where do we find out more? Uh, on Google+. Plus. That's where I'm posting most of the time, so that's where I am. Yep. Yeah, and I, I mention this every time, but you really got to follow Brian on Google+. Plus. He's got a great series of, of space explainers, which... And he... Well, we featured one on Universe Today, and I hope we're going to yeah. do a lot more. So, Brian Wang, where do we find out more? Uh, nextbigfuture.com. And also, I um, the rotating carnival of space is going on. I'll be hosting that um, this weekend. Yeah, so. if anyone anyone watching this, if you run a space blog, or you know you like to write about space, or you have you know any even I even do the even on Google Plus, uh, which is to check out the carnival of space. And Brian is the one who organizes it, and every week we sort of link all these stories together and it's a great way if you're trying to sort of get going as a blogger to get a lot more traffic and, and join this community. As you see, we're very inclusive. Um, so, uh, David Dickinson, where do we find out more? Uh, let's see, this week I was active on Canada.com, uh, Universe Today, my own site, Astrogaz with the Z, and I am Astrogaz on Twitter and Google+. Plus. I'm actually just Dave Dickinson on Google+, Plus because you can't have aliases there. Uh, and I will probably be bringing Jupiter to the Virtual Star Party Sunday night if the skies are clear. First Ooh. Virtual Star Party of 2014. Yeah, we're back with the Virtual Star Party on Sunday night. Yep. And you'll be clouded out. I probably will. Yeah. I might be able uh, to bring the moon, too. <laughs> Emily Lakdawalla, where do we find out more? Planetaria.org. You'll find me at planetaria.org slash blog and also on Twitter at elakdawalla. Right on. Jason Major. I'm at lightsinthedark.com. I write for Universe Today, and uh, starting this month, I'll be back writing uh, on Discovery Space News. Um, I'm also on Twitter. I'm on Google+. I'm on Facebook at Lights in the Dark, and I am on Twitter at JP Major, and I tweet a lot. So it's all space news. It's yeah, all good do. stuff. Um, <laughs> also, Let me mention real... Oh, go ahead. Finish, Jason. Oh, hey, I wanted to on. show you something cool. Something cool. I got for I have one of my, my cool Christmas gifts over here. It's a little something called Moon in My Room. And it's from Uncle Milton Toy Company. And what happens is, is you can turn on, with a remote control, the phases of the moon. And you can change them down and have them stay there at whatever you want. So, it, Or you can have it cycle through all the different phases. Um, it's a really neat little device. Um, so I'm loving it. it. It's perfect for my space cave here. And Emily Lockdewall, you were going to show off a certain uh, cover of some kind of dead tree. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this, this dead tree has my latest cover article on uh, Pluto and all of its friends in the Kuiper Belt. So go check it out. This article is a long time in the making, and it's pretty exhaustive, if I do say so myself. I just read that yesterday. That's a very, it was a very cool article. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. It has, it has that that image on there. That particular illustration is yes. one of the six that one we of the six. Yeah, that's one but of the there's, six. There's a new here. illustration in here. <laughs> here, we worked on this one. It has all of the correct uh, color and albedo of the largest Kuiper Belt object. So go check Ooh. it out. Oh, right. right on. So, and as always, I am uh, the publisher of Universe Today. You can find, you can join the sort of official Twitter feed, which is at Universe Today. My personal one is F Kane, uh, but but the other interesting thing to do is to follow us on YouTube, uh, which is Universe Today on YouTube. And we recently had a great interview with Emily, and there's another one coming where we talk about solar sails, and it's going to be another Emily conversation. So, uh, so check that out. Uh, so, you, if you're watching this somewhere, just click subscribe. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks to the panel for joining me in 2014. It was great to see some, uh, some familiar faces and some people we haven't seen for a while. So I think it's fantastic. Okay. And we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Later. Bye.